So, why study chemistry? Chemistry describes how substances interact with one another. It is the fundamental science behind biology, pharmacology, and all of the other life sciences. Over the duration of this course, we're going to be looking at how this will then impact the medicinal sciences, and we're going to be looking at some elements of medicinal chemistry. Indeed, the importance of chemistry itself cannot be understated, since it is a fundamental science um, into which medicinal chemistry um, is rolled. So, for example, without a knowledge of chemistry, you may be able to learn what happens, but you will not necessarily understand why. And if we look at the application of chemistry uh, to medicine, even across the board, everything from salicyclic acid um, in activation of cyclooxygenase all the way up to HIV-1 protease inhibition uh, by ritonavir. You can see that small molecule chemistry is by and large the most important element of chemistry in the context of medicine. There are, of course, some exceptions, the exceptions being the biologics, uh, such as the more recent ZMAP, um, uh, three monoclonal antibody treatment for Ebola. But equally uh, more reported within the last couple of years was the uh, neiman pick uh, one uh, inhibitor, which is actually a small molecule derivative. So chemistry itself is very important in the context of medicine. In uh, these lectures, which forms part of the course as a whole, we will see how an atom is made up, how they come together, and how they interact with each other. As time has gone by, within the last 100 to 150 years, the scientific knowledge of mankind has increased, and matter has been found to be made up of smaller fundamental particles. In particular, if we look at uh, subatomic particles, which you may be familiar with, such as uh, protons, neutrons, and electrons, they themselves are actually made up of even smaller uh, particles uh, falling into the quark and lepton class. But as we will see, when we are discussing chemistry, we are principally looking at the movements and the interactions of electrons. Anything which indeed goes Beneath that, in terms of size, typically speaking, we leave in the realms of physics. Chemistry is about the movement of electrons. Nuclear physics is about how nuclear particles interact with each other. And therefore, a knowledge of the latest developments in the discovery of these fundamental particles isn't necessarily essential um, for an appreciation of how electrons uh, move around and how ionic, covalent um, molecules and formula units can be formed, respectively. As indicated in the previous slide, there are certain small fundamental particles, such as leptons and quarks, which are really unnecessary um, at this level for understanding about chemistry. Chemistry at its very heart, as I mentioned before, is about electrons and not necessarily about the nucleus. If you look at the board, you'll be able to see three fundamental particles that you are expected uh, to be familiar with. They are the proton, the neutron, and the electron. The proton and the neutron are both nucleons. That is to say, they are subatomic particles which reside within the nucleus of an atom. Protons have a charge of plus one. Neutrons have a charge of zero. And they both have a mass of one atomic unit. One atomic unit, as you can see at the bottom of the board, is given as 1.67 times 10 to the power of minus 24 kilograms. And what is worthy of note, if you look at the table, is the third entry, the electron. Electrons have a charge of minus 1, but they have a substantially smaller mass. The mass of an electron is given relative to an AMU of 5.48 times 10 to the minus 4. However, the reality of this in kilograms is that an electron has a mass of 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. So very much smaller than those nucleons. Most of the atom is actually empty space, with the protons and the neutrons clustered together in the centre. And this is something uh, that was actually detected experimentally uh, by Thomson and Rutherford. The electrons seemingly form a cloud 
around the central nucleus. And it is these electrons which engage with each other to form matter, as we currently understand it, whether it's ionic or whether it is indeed covalent. And what we're going to be going through is how these individual arrangements of electrons, protons and neutrons come to form the elements that we see within the periodic table, a very important index uh, for the elements that we find on this planet. The analogy which is often used for the structure of an atom is that the nucleus is the ball on a center spot of a football field with the electrons actually being the tiny specks of dust blowing around the stands. Since within an atom there are equal numbers of protons and electrons, the overall charge of an atom as its element is zero. It has to be zero because the number of protons with a charge of plus one equals the number of electrons with a charge of minus one. So only certain combinations of fundamental particles can form stable atoms. And this goes back to what I was saying about the nucleus. Whilst it is not necessarily essential for us to understand it in the context of compound formation, it's important to be aware of the existence of things called isotopes. You have probably heard of the term radioactive isotope, and this, for example, would be where you have an unstable configuration of protons and neutrons within the nucleus that are liable to undergo a disintegration involving the loss of more of one of these fundamental particles. And it is the nucleus that decays in this case. It is also the origin, as we will see, of isotopes. These are elements which have the same chemical characteristics, but a different number of neutrons within the nucleus. And radioactive decay, to give you an example, would be not too dissimilar to that which you observe in the decay of uranium to thorium, or used in uh, the fission process in nuclear fission, the breakdown of uranium-235 to barium and krypton. And this process uh, would be known as a nuclear reaction, and the previous one I just mentioned as radioactive decay. So, let's get back to where we were originally, talking about the atoms and talking about the elements that we see in the periodic table. And there is some nomenclature that you should also be familiar with, and that is uh, shown here on the board, Z, N, and A. Z correlates to the atomic number or element number, and this relates to the number of protons in the nucleus and defines which element within the periodic table the atom actually is. N is the number of neutrons, which is the, obviously, as we would expect, uh, the neutron number. And finally, A, which is the combination of neutron number, N, and atomic number, Z. So this gives you the mass number. Since, as we've indicated earlier, electrons have a very, very, very small uh, mass, they are largely ignored from the overall mass of an atom. Instead, we tend to look at the combination of protons and neutrons when considering the atomic mass. So here we have an example of an atom. To properly identify it, it is written thus. Note, we have the uh, chemical symbol for this particular element, Cl. This correlates to chlorine. As you will see, uh, if you uh, interrogate the periodic table, you will often see elements which ostensibly don't make any sense um, in English um, or indeed in any other uh, European language because they are actually derived from the Latin or the Greek. So, for example, Cl, chlorine, chloros, comes from the Greek meaning green. And uh, as we will see a little later on, there are a number of other elements which also don't make sense in the context of their English name um, or their standard IUPAC names. So, anyway, as I was saying, if you look here, we have an example of the element chlorine. Note, the larger number at the top is A. This is the atomic mass number. The lower number is Z, which is the atomic number. 
And whenever you're looking at this, if you're getting confused as to what is an atomic number and what is an atomic mass number, the atomic mass number is always larger than the atomic number. So if you can't remember whether it's top or bottom, don't worry. Just find the largest number. That is the mass, which correlates to the number of protons and also the number of neutrons. Z is the atomic number, which correlates to the number of protons, as we indicated, but also just as important in elemental form, must therefore correlate to the number of electrons in the shells of that atom in order for it to have a charge of zero. Now, I've shown chlorine here for good reason, because it is one of those elements which exists as two stable isotopes within the periodic table. This is um, isotopes where you have the same chemical activity, because you have the same number of protons and therefore electrons in an atom, but a different number of neutrons. And as you can see here, we have, or I'm showing you here, three different isotopes, of which one is actually unstable. They are 35Cl and 37Cl and 36Cl, which is the unstable radioisotope with a half-life of 308,000 years, years and is negligible in concentration within the environment. The ones which are stable are 35 and 37. As you will see sometimes with periodic tables, the Z is often emitted because the chemical symbol of a particular element automatically defined in the periodic table further defines the number of protons and electrons it must possess. If we look at um, chlorine-35 as a stable isotope, it is found in 75% of all chlorine in the environment. 37Cl, on the other hand, is found in 25% of chlorine in the environment. And so therefore, when we are calculating the relative overall atomic mass, we need to take into consideration the natural occurrence of both of those isotopes. And we'll come on to an equation that deals with this a little later on. Now, you've probably all heard, or I hope you've all heard, of the periodic table. And it lists all of the elements, both natural and also man-made, in increasing order of atomic number, Z. Moving from left to to write. Here we have the first two groups in the periodic table. I'm showing you here uh, an extract from the first two groups where we have hydrogen, H, lithium, Li, sodium, Na. Remember what I said? Sodium actually relates to the Latin natrium. Okay? Hence the reason why it should be potentially SO in English, but the reality is it comes back to its Latin roots. Beryllium, which is at the fourth, and magnesium, which is in the third period. Now, as you can see in the periodic table, uh, you can observe we've got a number of different numbers above and beneath the chemical symbols. If we look at the number above, uh, it is the smallest number, and therefore it is the Z number, or atomic number. This correlates to the number of protons and the number of electrons that that element possesses in its atomic form. And as you'll see, you'll understand why I say atomic form, because a lot of elements in nature don't exist as atoms. They actually exist either as ions or they exist as molecules. But for the purposes of explaining basic atomic structure, we consider them in isolation, whether they exist like this in nature or not. As you can see um, on the board, I've introduced another uh, letter there, A, which correlates to the atomic mass. Okay. Now, notice the atomic mass here is larger than the atomic number, and it correlates to the number of protons and the number of neutrons, as I said earlier. Also, take note of the fact that the numbers are not whole. And this is because in the periodic table, you have to take into consideration the different types of isotopes which have different uh, masses overall when calculating the relative atomic mass. And I'll show you how to do that in a second. Right, so here we have an example of how you would calculate the relative atomic mass of chlorine. And here, as you can see, they are proportional to their abundance. Now, recall what I said 
75% of all chlorine atoms exist in their 35 uh, atomic mass form, whereas approximately 25% exist as the 37 atomic mass form of chlorine. So what we need to do is we need to find a weighted average of those two isotopes to give us the relative atomic mass that you would see in the periodic table. Now, I'm not going to go through this entire equation with you. Suffice to say, conceptually, it's relatively easy to do. Let's say for the sake of argument, uh, you had 75 uh, atoms in one hand, each weighing 35 grams, and you had 25 in the other hand, each weighing 37. All you would have to do is multiply the mass by each percentage and then average the two. That's effectively what we've done here. This gives us an average atomic mass unit for chlorine of 35.5. Shown here is 35.45, but on most periodic tables you will see it's rounded up. And whilst the structure of the nucleus is important in radiochemistry and physics, in terms of the chemical characteristics, an atom of chlorine 35 will behave the same chemically as an atom of chlorine 37. It makes no difference to their reactivity. The only way you can even detect this sometimes is via certain analytical chemistry techniques, which are beyond the scope of this course. So, when the structure of electrons of the atom was established, and we knew that electrons were spinning around the outside, at least that was the theory. There was some sort of Newtonian planetary model where effectively the protons, the positive charge on the protons, held the electrons effectively via a simple harmonic uh, force, centripetal acceleration, constantly holding them in the same way a satellite would orbit around a planet. However, this rather simplistic model, which um, implied that electrons existed only as particles, was based, was fundamentally flawed by the question. If positive charges attract negative charges, and we know they do, opposites attract, why don't electrons crash into the nucleus? So why is it, like for example we see as satellites orbit the Earth, eventually slowing down and having lower and lower orbits until eventually losing uh, their orbital stability and crashing into the ocean? Why do you not see electrons crashing in to the proton-rich nucleus? And this was a problem. So let's have a look. We've got here in the case of 35Cl and 37Cl, the same number of electrons and the same number of protons. We've got here, though, in the case of each of our isotopes, a different number of neutrons, 18, 19, and 20. So... As I talked about in the previous slide, if we have a positively charged nucleus, why isn't the negative charge of the electron result in the electron itself moving towards the nucleus itself? What stops the electrons from crashing into the nucleus? And this is the basis of, of quantum mechanics, the understanding that energy exists in small discrete packets. And it was the Danish physicist Niels Bohr who came up with a solution uh, to this issue uh, of electrons not actually ending up uh, in uh, 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 crashing into the nucleus in the early 20th century. And he put forward a couple of ideals. The amount of energy which an electron has determines how far away it is from the nucleus. So in other words, the more energy it has, the further away it is from the grasp of the positive charge. He also suggested that electrons could only be at certain specific distances from the nucleus. And whereas my analogy uh, earlier of a satellite orbiting uh, around a planet means that it could technically exist at a number of different altitudes away from the Earth, in this particular case we're saying that quantized energy means that they can only exist, uh, electrons can only exist at certain discrete distances away from uh, from the nucleus of an atom. So to use a, an analogy here of electrons and quantization of energy, we'll take the example of a staircase which is shown on the board. A person, shown on the board, moves from one step to the other. But they can only be on one step at a time and 
The higher up the staircase they are, the greater the amount of potential energy they have with respect to the ground. This, if you'll recall, is the very basic uh, level of uh, understanding for potential energy is equal to mass times gravity times height. Also, you can only move one step at a time. It is not possible to move more than one step at a time. And that, is, as shown here, means that your movement from four to two is forbidden. But your movement from three to two is allowed. So the movement of a person up a single step or down a single step is permitted, but more than that is not. So these energy levels, as postulated by Niels Bohr, are called shells. And electrons, rather than existing just as a random cloud at a specific distance, exist at a number of different distances from the central nucleus. The highest energies are actually further away. The principal quantum number is given as the, no, the actual lowest possible quantum value for that shell and is regarded as the principal quantum number. So if we look at the shell which is nearest to the nucleus, we see uh, it has the quantum number one. If we move one shell away, it has the quantum number two, then three, and then four. As the shells become larger, i.e. as they move further and further away from the nucleus, we can see that they hold more and more electrons. And we'll be going through the makeup of these shells in the next lecture when we start looking at orbitals. But from a quantum perspective, each shell can carry a specific number of electrons. Shell 1, which is that which is nearest the nucleus, can carry only two electrons. Shell 2 can carry eight. Shell 3 can carry 18. And shell 4 can carry 32. And as we'll see, this is because as we increase the shell number, the principal quantum number, we have at our availability a large number of orbitals. And as we'll see, each orbital can contain two electrons. The relative energy of these shells increases as we move further and further away. But as I indicated in the previous slide, this means that the relative energy required to remove an electron from a shell actually decreases. In order to move an electron to a higher energy shell, which is analogous to the idea of a person moving from one step to the other, a specific amount of energy is required. And that energy is called the quantum energy. This is the energy, a small amount of energy, which is required to move a particle from a specific distance away from a proton to the next distance away from the proton. I to move it from shell one, for example, to shell two. And as you'll see, when we uh, start talking about molecular orbitals and interactions, these movements of electrons from higher shells to lower shells are the origins of things like fluorescence and phosphorescence. Indeed, if you look at the atomic absorption or atomic emission spectroscopy for individual atoms, you'll see that their colors are to do with transitions of electrons from one shell to the other and then back again. So in the case of our um, idealized atom, which is shown on the board here, you'll see that we have movement of an electron from a shell nearest the nucleus to a shell further from the nucleus when a quantum of energy is absorbed. Now, this energy uh, can be light energy, for example, or it could theoretically be heat energy. When an electron moves back from its outer shell, as shown here, shown with the green line, back to that electron which is nearest the nucleus, we see uh, a quantum of energy emitted, usually as a photon of light. So, the findings of Bohr have given rise to a very complex science, which we will touch upon briefly, of quantum mechanics. And, and these were uh, based on a lot of the work done by Schrodinger and also by Heisenberg. And the ideas of quantum mechanics are thus, that energy only comes in fixed quanta. In other words, you can't have an infinitesimal amount of um, energy. You can only have energy which exists as certain fixed packets, fixed packets of energy. The other 
uh, part of it, and this relates specifically to electrons, uh, is that everything can be thought of as either a particle or a wave. And the wave-like possible, the wave-like properties of a large object, for example, people and items in the world around us, are very, very small. However, the wave-like property of things which are really, really small, like electrons, is actually quite pronounced. And this was where the original planetary model of electrons orbiting around a nucleus was flawed, because it implied only that an electron had a particle-like property, rather than a wave-like property. So this relates, as I said before, to the uncertainty principle and wave equations uh, for electrons and other particles. And what these mean is that when you're looking at an electron, you can't talk about an electron as being in a discrete part of a shell. All you can do is determine where is the greatest probability of being able to find it. And this may seem irrelevant to the context of, let's say, uh, covalent and ionic bonding going forward, but it's very important because it relates to the existence, shape, and energy of orbitals, as we will see a little later on. And so when we're looking at um, the application of these principles and the application of quantum mechanics and their associated equations uh, to uh, an atom structure, we tend to consider electrons as waves, and therefore we're looking at the probability or probability density of finding an electron at a specific distance from a nucleus in a specific shape. As I mentioned, the shells themselves can be divided into orbitals, each of which contains two electrons. Orbitals are characterized by a shape uh, that's produced when the region surrounding the nucleus is plotted, in which it's typically regarded that a 95% chance exists of finding the electrons. The orbital shapes that we will come across are S, P, D, and F. And we're mostly going to focus on S, P, and D orbitals. The analogy to use is that each shell unlocks, if you like, an additional orbital type. So in other words, for the first shell, you can only get the S-type orbital. For the second shell, you can get the S and the P-type orbitals. And for the third shell, you can get S, P, and D. And for the fourth, it's possible to have access to all four. Bearing in mind, each individual orbital can only contain two electrons. And we'll talk about this in more depth a little later. The orbital quantum numbers are given for S orbitals as zero, one, two, and three. And the nomenclature in quantum mechanics, where N was for principal quantum number, is that the orbital quantum number carries the letter L. So, as we will see, it's possible to actually assign the specific uh, designation of an electron just using quantum numbers. The simplest orbital, as you can see here, is where L, or the orbital quantum number, is equal to zero, and it is spherical. Here you can see uh, three particular types uh, or shells of orbital, the 1s, the 2s, and the 3s. Each of these is spherical, but as you can see, each of these is of a different size. As, of course, we move further away from the nucleus, of course, the electrons themselves, or the probability of finding them, is also more distant from the nucleus. Also bear in mind it's spherical, and so the x, y, and z axes there demonstrate the three-dimensionality of this species and the fact that there is a 95% probability of finding electrons within this region. Note, of course, that if you go back to the basic quantum mechanics, uh, the theoretical chance of finding an electron in the nucleus is, of course, zero. So, going from left to right, 1s is a s orbital, which is a spherical orbital, um, which actually stands for sharp rather than spherical, which is rather counterintuitive. The 2s is an s orbital in shell 2, and the 3s is an s orbital in shell 3. And each of these, the 1s, the 2s, and the 3s, can formally contain two electrons. P orbitals, these are principal orbitals. And this is where you have an orbital quantum number of one. 
or L equals 1, are more complex. And remember what I said, as you move up the shells, it's possible to accommodate more and more electrons. The only way to do this, of course, is to have more and more different types of orbital. And here we can see three of these, the 2PY, the 2PX, and the 2PZ. Note the number prior to the PY, PX, and PZ correlates to the principal quantum number, which in this case is the lowest one for p orbitals of 2. It is, of course, possible to get 3p and 4p orbitals, but of course not possible to get 1p. You haven't unlocked them at that point. Note the similarities between these guys. Uh, they are uh, dumbbell-shaped, is often uh, the shape that's considered, and their orientation is along the three component axes. That is the y-axis, the x-axis, and the z-axis, as shown in, uh, in, uh, in this particular slide. Crucially, if we look in the center where the node is formed, where we have the tiny um, spot in the center, is where the nucleus is. And there, we have a, an electron density of zero. Now, the question you may be asking is, well, why are they shaded differently? And this is what I'm going to uh, come to uh, in a moment. A p orbital has two regions where electrons may be found on either side. Note what I've done is we've got a, a plane through uh, the node of the p orbital, as shown here. And along that plane, there exists no electron density, as it contains the nucleus. But, again, what is the significance of the negative and the positive charges? And this is to do with the phase of electrons. Now, remember what I said. We tried to discount the idea of treating electrons as particles, because it created a lot of theoretical problems for us. In fact, we understand that electrons exist in shells and can only go up or down those shells by absorbing or giving off quanta of energy. Equally, we talked about electrons existing in waves, and that's why we can only talk about the probability of finding them in particular parts um, of an atom. And this is the same analogy, because in this case, we're talking about wave coherence. We're talking about whether or not an electron exists um, as the peak here of the trough that we're showing here, this sine wave, or as the trough. Right, so as I mentioned, um, it's possible for, to treat electrons as waves um, as well as as particles. Uh, and in the context of the p orbital, this is very important. So if we look at uh, this waveform here, uh, we can see that it is um, analogous uh, to the uh, dumbbell shape of our p orbital where if we see in the center node, the chances of finding an electron are zero. But the chances of finding an electron either side are reasonably high. So if we think of an electron as a wave with positive and negative regions, we can think about the ideas of coherence, i.e. constructive or destructive interference. So as there are three p orbitals, there needs to be a way of telling them apart. Because if you look here, you can see uh, that they are degenerate. And by that, what I'm talking about here is the idea that you could superimpose one on the other by a simple rotation around 90 degrees. And so a way of defining an electron in a given p orbital is via the magnetic quantum number, or ML. Okay, Not to be confused with MS. That is a different one which we will come on to a little later. So this helps us to define the direction uh, of an orbital as well um, as its type. So here we can see we've got the orbital running along the y-axis, then across the x-axis, and then finally along the z-axis. So, d orbitals. These have a more complex set of shapes, and they have the orbital quantum number of 2. The d in d orbital stands for diffuse. And they have two nodal planes and come in sets of 5. The ml, or magnetic uh, orbital number, can be minus 2, 
minus 1, 0, 1, or 2. And don't just take it uh, and accept it as read. There is actually an equation which we'll come on to in the next lecture, which explains how you can uh, determine this yourselves. The lowest energy shell uh, containing d orbitals is n equals 3. Prior to that, they haven't been unlocked. Degeneracy. This is what I alluded to in the case of the p orbitals, and as we'll see a little later on, in the d orbitals. These are orbitals with the same energy. When they have the same energy and they have the same orientation, they're regarded as degenerate. In other words, they're superimposable onto each other. And this is the case for p and also some of the d orbitals. And degeneracy uh, is based on the idea that whilst they have the same energy and the electrons or the probability of finding them is the same diff distance from the nucleus, they point in different directions. By rotating them 90 degrees in the three axes, however, they would all be identical. They're all superimposable and therefore they're termed degenerate.